Well, wel welcome. That's working. Uh, I'm Michelle Newton, Deputy Director of Art Space. And if I can first begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation and their elders past, present and future. And to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in the audience today. Um, and thank you for coming Sunday, 12 p.m. We're all just commenting it's a tough ask <laughs> at this time of day. Um, but we're here today um, to talk about collaboration under the aptly titled Creative Juices, working with the visual artists in other creative fields. And it's really talking about collaboration, um, you know, thinking about how we can work together and how we can be greater together. And today I have uh, Angelo Candelipus, architect who's been collaborating with Janet Lawrence, artist. Um, Raphael, oh my God, it's just dropped out of my head. <laughs> Kritamat, yeah. Uh, chef, who's been collaborating with Pinari Santapak. Amanda Cole, composer, who's been collaborating with Michaela, Michaela Gleave on her work. Um, and we have three very different examples of collaborations, each you know, from the performative to public art, et cetera. So today we'll be looking at how collaboration is increasingly becoming a form of practice with, um, for visual artists and to look at some of the reasons why uh, this phenomenon is kind of part of what we do. Uh, from the desire to create new, new projects, new works, from sharing knowledge and resources, through thinking about how we build relationships across time, difference, and distance. So hopefully we'll get to kind of ideas around, I guess, questioning um, notions of authorship potentially, but really focusing on how, through collaboration, uh, we think about uh, community, reciprocity, and exchange. And so I'll begin with you, Pinari, because you have a long history with your project, the Breast Stupa um, Cookery Project. It's, uh, you've been working with many collaborators for early, since the early 2000s on this particular project and collaborating with many chefs um, on, you know, in projects that have happened in New Zealand and in Thailand and other places, and most recently here in Sydney on Friday night with your Vuz Gallery. And you collaborated with Raphael from Ross Kitchen on this project. So can you tell us like, how your collaboration, like where the idea for the Breast Dupa project really began? Hi, thank you, Michelle. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and um, Chef Ralph and, and all of us. Um, I started uh, the Breast Dupa cookery project since 2005, and that was the time I was um, working, uh, concentrating on different uh, works, uh, focusing on sensory perceptions, on different sensory perceptions, starting from like touch, from the no, gnome, my pillow, installations, scent from candles, um, and uh, movement uh, from like temper and sanity, and then of course, as a Thai, we love eating, and uh, I, I want, to, I like to bake, um, I like to cook, and uh, I, I want to incorporate food into my work. I was making a lot of bread at that time, but, um, you know, I, di I didn't think bread dough was, it, it wasn't quite right yet, and then uh, I was working on some ceramic projects, and uh, and then, one day it just clicked, then um, I'll make these cooking molds and invite different chefs to work with them and uh, interpret them. Um, to interpret this shape, uh, I, I, I call breast stupas, which started around 2001, so it's like um, about five years uh, earlier, and uh, combining the sacred and the sensual together. Um, so at that time I thought, Okay, uh, I've been working on this project for so long, and now it's longer, <laughs> and uh, and see what other people see in these shapes and forms and concepts, and uh, it's my way of getting out of the art world, um, and uh, connecting with chefs and food, and uh, food becoming what's better than food becoming the art medium and the connection, and uh, so that's why I kept on with the project. And uh, whenever that's possible, we've had projects ranging from uh, like tea ceremonies 
course, art exhibition openings uh, or the dinner for, for the gallery opening um, the other night for 40 people, 40 guests. And um, every itineration is different, and that's what excites me. I, I, don't, I don't tell the, uh, the chef what to do, the artists themselves, and um, it's... I, I just let them, uh, I, I, I send them uh, a sample set of the, the, the molds and then talk a bit and then just see how they, they, they get inspired. It's uh, some chefs um, uh, not, uh, are more into like the flesh or the body, some are more conceptual about the nurturing over the mother or um, the the uh, the Maori chefs in uh, Parihaka in the New Zealand they they were they 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 they, they were using um, uh, these uh, berries that that uh, enhance menstrual uh, cycles like that so so it, it all varies and that's that's why that's why it's continuing yeah. yes so so better to to ask uh, <laughs> Chef Rob how how he came up with the menu and how how he interpreted it. Yeah. Yes. So essentially, you were handed the the molds, oh, yeah, and you, like it was your it, you were you know you were free to interpret as you chose. It could have been literal, or it could have been conceptual, it could have been aesthetic. So, what was your response when Pinnery sent you the the, sh the kind of forms to work with? Yeah, um, I think for me. Uh, oh. Uh, for myself, um, I initially had a wave of um, ideas come through, and it wasn't actually until I saw the molds that it really solidified um, how I want to go about it. Um, first of all, I want to touch base that within my family there's a, a history of breast cancer, and so it was something that was very close to me, and yeah, it was something I was very proud of uh, to show and share with my grandmother, who... Um, has survived. Um, so I guess my background is I'm a chef, but um, I would also call myself a nature cook um, and a forager. So for me, um, I instantly connect with um, the motherland, which is I'm grateful to be um, Australian. And yeah, so I guess it was um, incorporating uh, native Australian ingredients that were both foraged and sourced around um, to then, yeah, create with that. So that was in the form of um, Davidson plum chocolates or wattle seeds. Um, so wattle seeds just have this beautiful um, caramel, coffee, chocolate flavor to them. And yeah, I guess it was, that's, that's how I interpret it for myself. And what was your experience working together? Because, yeah, essentially it was a dinner for 40 people, opening the new space for you was gallery. And you know, how, did, like, how did you both kind of come together and work? Like, how did you communicate over that period of time in the lead up to that performance event dinner that happened? Yeah, so for us, we, we caught up um, over Skype, um, I believe. And it was just, I, I felt an in, instant connection. So I guess, um, for me, food is also a big part of connection. Um, and from what I could understand, that was part of Pinnery's vision as well. And Because the Gary sent me a list of uh, wonderful chefs, and uh, I, I was drawn to um, uh, Chef Roth's website uh, that he had a garden. That, that I, I love gardening, and then, and then that, that was the... Uh, yeah. The, I uh, think the, the connection yeah. was, um, yeah, through the, the love of nature and, yeah, the gardening and foraging, yeah. So that there were lots of veg vegetables yeah. and fresh Yeah, exactly, greens. exactly. So there was a period of time where um, I was living up in the hinterlands of Byron Bay, and that's where I kind of established my garden again and, and was able to, yeah, forage and, yeah. So um, sometimes, sometimes uh, we would use the breast to cookery molds as a container, as the plate, or but but this time it was more of the um, concept and and, and the um, the ingredients itself that 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 uh, became the meal. But uh, we we placed the ceramic molds in on the table, and some were in the water in the in the vases. So I think it connects with the water, the land, and and the uh, 
the plants here. So, so there, there are sub subtle layers in, in, in the event. How, how did you find it? You, you were one of the guests. <laughs> it was delicious to begin with. But I think, you know, it's what you were both, what you both speak about, you know, that idea of um, bringing together people over food and building a community. And I think it was a really important moment because obviously the dinner represented many things, obviously the opening of the gallery, but also um, I think too, um, you know, we're still coming off the back of a pandemic and you know, people haven't been able to gather in that way. So I think really that kind of gathering and gathering with people, some familiar, some kind of unknown, was a really beautiful moment. So for me, you know, I had the opportunity to meet people who I'd never, you know, never met before and people who you ordinarily wouldn't cross paths with. So I think for me, the idea of the gathering became quite poignant in, you know, sitting together and kind of breaking bread in, in a sense, you know, over the meal. And Pinari, can I ask you, because I think you mentioned this is like, you've had maybe 30 iterations of this project and it's all obviously happened globally in many places. How has the project evolved from that initial, um, you know, to like 2005 when you initially sort of began the project to now? Like what are the sort of shifts and changes that you've noticed in the project? The project is like um, planning a dinner party <laughs> well, uh, you know, um, get, gather friends, families, or uh, visitors, strangers, and, and get to know them. Mm -hmm. And um, so each time, it's it depends on the, um, the event, the circumstances, and uh, uh, the more I do it, then then I, I try to do something that's different every time. But it usually comes out very different, even you know, not planning. Yeah. Um, uh, it sometimes it's very jovial, so, um, you know, gatherings of at at art openings, like you said. I, I had my last one before here was in 2020 uh, at a gallery in 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 Bangkok, and and everybody was that was October 2020, and we we thought it was going to be over soon, and and everybody was coming out, and um, and then there was a lockdown again, but then. Um, like you said, it's like we're, we're human beings and, and, and the uh, personal connection, the physical connection is important. And um, uh, I've become very good friends with a lot of chefs and I, I know Chef Ralph will be visiting me in Bangkok soon. Yes. <laughs> so so um, this connection is, is, uh, is, is the core of, of the project, yes. Well, you both definitely achieved that on Friday yeah. night. <laughs> And if I can jump to a very different project between you, Janet, and Angelo. Um, obviously, you've been working on a building in Favot Street, um, and the title of the work is Breath in Glass. Is that correct, Janet? Yes. <laughs> um, and similarly, if you could tell us, you know, how this project kind of came into being, um, like how did it, how did you two come together in terms of this collaboration in working together? Angelo called me. <laughs> um, we've known Did each, you know each other's work. I've got enormous respect for Angelo's work. We'd often said it'd be good to do something. And there it was. Well, uh, for me, um, it's very interesting because we've never talked about this. So this is the first real opportunity for us to really articulate precisely what happened or reflect upon it. And um, I'd been commissioned to do a project and it's always the case for us that we try and achieve a sense of otherworldliness in the spaces that are provided, or are provided an opportunity to create. And in this instance, there was a project where we were extending an existing building mm -hmm. and it was for a commercial use and the now familiar approach of that commercial endeavour, which is this sense of an open office plan and all the sort of things that are happening in uh, in offices, I found quite boring. And I find it as though architects behave in this default position where they have a series of items in a recipe book of what they do and they tell everyone what they do about sustainability, they tell everyone what they do about 
office space and how people should behave and collaboration is this sort of word that people like to use but I find it quite boring. And what I told my client is that what we wanted to do <clears throat> was create something that was like we're entering another world so that people in their reflections on what uh, they were doing perhaps could on occasion skip a beat and enter into a space which gave them something more than just open work workspaces or collaborative spaces or lounges and things. So where my mind went was that rather than fill the space that we were adding to this existing building with floor plate, we would create a volumetric space that reminded one of a kind of connection they have with their own spirituality. Mm. And that space is a four-story volume. So the first arguments we had with our developer client were ones associated with not putting floor space yes. into the building. The second was with the council because we were saying that we wanted to create art but not have it in the public domain. And so there was this idea that there's a very public dimension to private space that needed to also be understood. And the last thing was an advocacy to create something extraordinary in glass. And actually, I don't know anyone else that could do it with the light. So we created these walls that would not allow for any direct light to come in and then in the design sought for that to be something that facilitated a transcendental space and the only person I could think to do it was Janet. And so usually there's tenders for these things and you find silly little competitions where they try and find the appropriate artist but it's really silly if you've already worked through in your mind how to make something and you know the person able to do it, um, why not just speak to them and why not just have a conversation with them, plead with them as I did to do it. There were often times where I thought you were just going to abandon me <laughs> because I actually needed tenant. you. We, tenant I was going to oh. abandon. I need, we needed, I needed Janet to help because without Janet the space would not have been whole. So in, in, if that's a collaboration, yeah. well, call it what you may. I don't call it a collaboration. I call it a co-authorship, yeah. um, which is different. Yeah. We're not really collaborating in a sense. No. But, but it, it went through a lot of changes because there were unfortunately different interests that were putting their, their voices forward. Unfortunately, the tenant who didn't want art to start with, so we had to have something that didn't look like art, and so um, and and then the council who wanted it to be public, so we had to make sure it was visible from the street, and the, all of these things made um, adjustments to the piece that evolved very much from being a sort of um, it, it became in the end quite quite sparse in the end. Um, but that it's probably better. But also the um, the veils open and close all down the bottom, so that the tenant can get his wish and, and do what he wants with it. But um, they were, so it. The thing about it is, for me, it became like a breathing. It was like a, a when I talk about the breath in glass. Of course, that's metaphorical, as we you know we blow glass and glass has this whole mineral lineage. It's whole connected with breath and. And, but it was also the breath of being able to breathe in and out the nature outside, because always my work addresses um, nature, so to speak. Yeah. And so that was that idea of bringing nature in, um, in, in this way, through, through the light that would come through the glass. But also there's these amazing trees outside that go through I mean, they're incredible because they are indigenous. They are, sorry, they're not indigenous trees. They they go through. A, a, they they're deciduous trees. 
So that's really lovely. So it gave a whole range of sort of colour that could come into the work so that it does reflect the outside and bring it inside. And, and it, is a, it, it, it is a beautiful design, those windows, how they work proportionally. And, and um, I think that for me it was a beautiful um, template in some ways to work with to create that sensation. You know, yeah. And I'm kind of interested, you know, obviously when I asked you this question just before when we were gathering, um, you know, I think it, it is really important because particularly in the arts, so many opportunities stem from personal relationships that then become professional relationships. And it's a really important part of how, you know, I feel like the visual arts are fueled. Like we kind of work with our peers, whether they began as friendships or romantic partnerships or whatever they might be, that's how kind of people come together. But there's also pragmatic decisions why people come together, whether it's conscious or not, whether it's like splitting the division of labor. So I think, you know, it's kind of interesting that you had this pre-existing relationship that kind of brought you to this moment and can I ask the tenant like who is the tenant of that building like and did that like did they have they obviously had a, a well, role I, in kind of can you <laughs> can I talk before we before we go into the realm of de defamation um, <laughs> what what I need to say about relationships is that actually if you're interested in art um, you become friends with those people you respect uh, so we don't really have a friendship in a sense that it came from nowhere and suddenly we found ourselves as friends and suddenly we discovered that, oh, Janet could do some art. That That's not the way it works. How it worked for me was I sought her work through knowledge I had of the work that she did and I made sure that I became her friend because I liked it. Um, and I was respectful in every interaction which then facilitated a kind of, let's say, respectful friendship. Otherwise, friendships don't occur in that way uh, amongst, let's call them, professionals. Um, I think the work is, with, the work is that with, with which we're engaged. And if the work starts to become poor, my sense is that I move further away from those friendships because I think, oh, well, they're letting go a bit. They don't any longer have the same values as me. Um, and I hope the same applies for others. Um, in terms of the tenant, the tenant, look, people are always the compromise, aren't they? In art, people are always the people. I mean, you know, why do you want people's uninformed opinions about your work? And yet, here we are constantly um, justifying our existence to every neighbour to every dog and cat on the street, frankly. And that's part of what we just acknowledge we have to do. And so... That's in architecture, particularly. Well, in architecture, it's like you're at the behest of every... The great unwashed turned up, you know? And what you do is you say, OK, well... I have to find a way to love those people because they're people too and they have an opinion. Um, sometimes I wonder. But I've had things thrown at me. I've had bottles thrown at me. I've had um, people threaten to come and see me personally, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so does a project like this with Janet, like, did you have to kind of go through a lot of red tape with the local council or things, or is it... You didn't, but I did. She <laughs> says, no, 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 no. Because that is part of the processing, <laughs> I imagine, in... It was what they call a shitload of red tape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go through it. <laughs> I mean, I know this because art space is going through this itself with it's, its own building redevelopment I and know. we're trying to get things yeah, up. Architecture, it's just unbelievable what has well, to go through. I just through. put it to one side and forget about it because they're the sort of people that sit in the background and tick boxes and you kind yeah. of just rise above it yeah, like you, you said to. You have rise to. above it and you say yes yes we'll tick that box thank you very much for turning up we couldn't have done it without you but if i could just say though there's a huge difference in collaborating into architecture than if you have an art project and you collaborate with someone on your art project the art the artist is the controller of that and it's very, very different if you do something into a public space or into a building, which is usually a public 
or private of something. So there's other people's opinions that enter into it. And it's very different experience. Because normally I collaborate with scientists or something on my own projects. So I don't ever have any of these compromises that come into architectural projects. And that was going to be my question. I mean, unlike, say, Pinaree's project, which is continually sure. evolving through different iterations, like, like how, through this project, did you retain the vision for the work, but sort of still work around all of those kind of bureaucratic parameters that you must have been navigating as well? Let me put a little bit of context. The project is a $70 million project for our client. And he's a private client, he owns it. Yeah. Uh, the city has this sense of propriety because the city wants good outcomes and good luck to them and fantastic. They do uh, actually generally a good job. Without the city, we wouldn't have been able to do this, actually. So um, thank God for them. And then there's every single person associated with the project, from people within the company of the client who feel it's their obligation to make sure that... I mean, there's this race for cheapness, if you've noticed, in construction. So I always try and... We don't really work for that many people that allow that in, but in this instance, it was one of those... There was a, there was a person with a cause, you know? Let's make it as cheap as possible. Um, and then there's, an, you know, 30 engineering companies associated with the consent that we're engaging, that every single one of them has a say, and they have to have, just as the artist has an import into what we do, they have to have an import into what, to, what we do. And then there's the series of objectors who complain about the fact that you're building something. And those objectors go to council and complain. So that's the sort of context I'm working in. And the worst of them is that you have to meet a budget and time, and there was a tenant now, the worst of them is the tenant in this in instance, really? because the tenant um, said that they needed to be in the building by a certain time, and we needed to have everything constructed for them to be in there in a certain time, and they signed a contract before we even had an approval to do the work at council. So they were on our back all the time, and we would have meetings with um, the tenant and their personal assistant who who became very vocal and she became this person that knew what art was and she would give us ideas you know here I've got I've got my own ideas and I'd think oh my god and then I said I mean, why would we, you we should say they're these young unicorns <laughs> then, then she then she kind of had this moment where we, we didn't know what was going on because she'd resign. Now, why is a person that who is able to resign have any say at all? <laughs> why is an employee in a firm who is able to resign have any say at all? But this is, this is what happens in the kind of contemporary world of employment, where people want to be kind of powerful. So she was really difficult. And Janet then, I got a call from the director of planning one Saturday morning and said, um, Janet's just about to walk. And I said, no, she's not. No, she's not. I'm going to call her. No, but can I just say <laughs> what he said? This is under 25-year-old unicorn. Um, <laughs> we don't want art. We don't want to look rich. Mind you, they're making. I said, don't worry, you don't look rich. <laughs> <laughs> but this was this incredible thing. You look really poor. <laughs> <laughs> he came to the meeting with a surfboard under his arm. <laughs> billionaire, billionaire. Yeah, and they're still... <laughs> so anyway, they, they, they look, they, they, that's it, that's enough. Okay. I guess my question is, you know... I'm going to be sued. Can I just say they, they have destroyed the lower floor because they've done this terrible fit out. And so I have to say, from the point of view of trying to protect artwork, there have to be controls on what can happen, you know, in a space where the art is. It's just, <laughs> it's a terrible dilemma, you know. Well, when they bomb the Parthenon, you accept there's no controls on <laughs> art. Yes. 
<laughs> and is that some, I guess, yeah, that is, kind of, that is essentially my question. Um, you know, the final, like, I guess, I guess through all of these negotiations, like, as frustrating and irritating as they sound, were you able to retain the kind of integrity of your vision? Like, do, like were, do you feel at the end you were able to achieve what you both set out to do in that building? I think so, but except, I mean, look, it's there and they'll go eventually. Yeah. So the art is there, the walls, the wall is there, this breathing wall. Mm -hmm. And um, th th uh, unfortunately, they, they, whoever works in there, they don't, um, they don't care about that, but mm. they've... My, my attitude to architecture is it has to be robust enough for people yeah. to imagine what the vision was intended yeah. to be, yeah. because it's never going to be okay. Mm. There's always people that come in and do things, even in a house, you know, what are you going to do? Tell them what rug to put on the floor and, you know, you can't. So there needs to be a strategy in architecture that deals with um, layers of projected message, messaging about what mm. is intended and those that are more aware or have a resonance or frequency able to understand these things can see what was intended um, because it's never going to be 100%. There's too many factors in between. I think that's an interesting kind of point too in that you're kind of managing that balance where um, you, you, know, you don't want to put too many rules or protocols around the work but allowing the flexibility of the work to exist and kind of giving it a life of its own for you know, the people who inhabit and occupy that space over time. And so you kind of, I imagine you have to kind of let go in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, which is kind of part of that process. It's just not a painting, and it's just not a picture on a wall. It doesn't exist in its own terms, yeah. It has, it has, to, it has to collaborate with a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> with the people. <laughs> and if I can jump to you, Bakayla and Amanda. Um, again, similarly, you've both been collaborating over many projects over a few years. And like, like Jan Janet, you've been collaborating with many different type of practitioners as well as scientists, et cetera, and musicians. Can you tell us, you know, I guess, well, the work, you know, there was a work here on Friday, Thursday night, Thursday night, Cosmic Time, um, which was played here and iterated three times in this space, um, and which you collaborated with Amanda. Can you give us a sense of how that project began as well? Um, yeah, so I've been very fortunate to work with Amanda since 2014. We first started working together, so it's coming up to a long time now. <laughs> and the projects just keep rolling, um, which is super exciting. So the very, how, how our collaboration came into being um, is actually, I'm just thinking, I only realised that the work that inspired our first project together was actually my first real collaboration also. <laughs> um, I'd created a dot matrix printer that prints out the details of one star every minute in real time for wherever the object is located. Um, and after trying to wrestle how to make this thing for six months, um, I, like, by accident was put in contact with an astronomer or astrophysicist who I'd happened to go on to high school with, but I'd just forgotten about this person or didn't even consider that as a possibility. <laughs> um, and I emailed him about something else actually and mentioned, I was like, oh, probably should just mention this to Michael, see what he says. And he said, oh, that's a casual Sunday afternoon of coding for me. And I'd spent six months trying to make this thing <laughs> through a variety of failed attempts. Um, and I posted an image of that work on social media. Um, the artwork uses the beautiful fan fold continuous paper um, from a dot matrix printer and Amanda messaged me and said send me the file I'll turn it into sound and kapow like amazing <laughs> I'm you're so excited about that because I saw it and I just thought oh yeah totally that's like stars and I use a program called max MSP where you can put data in it and map you know data to sound basically um, so yeah I saw it as just music work and then we both got excited about it and then I have a, uh, I guess, Warren, who is, uh, I, I had previously done some projects with, another collaborator, who's an amazing um, programmer. He does a sort of, oh, even more technical programming, so the sort of more back-end C++, OSC type programming. 
Um, so we were able to pull him in to do some programming. We made some apps and everything to work. Went on to choir pieces and this whole sort of thing. Yeah, it sort of it sort of just tumbled along. So Amanda and I started chatting about how to sonify the star, the star information that I had. So that little piece of code that the astronomer wrote for us has lived on through all these other projects. Um, and I think we sort of we, we just gelled quite instantly because I could imagine what how this might work. So we tr we treated the Earth as a giant spinning music box, and when a star comes up over the horizon, it triggers a note. And so Amanda created a beautiful um, scale or a spectral chord that would get triggered by these sounds. Um, I was super excited about the project when we were trying to figure out what platform this was going to exist on. Like, how do you make a work that's live, um, involving sound, and the details that we needed to generate it were time and GPS coordinates and um, also orientation, which is obviously three things that smartphones have built into them automatically. So originally we were thinking, oh, maybe we have it as a web project or something, but obviously smartphone was the obvious platform how we would sort of present this project. Um, I got very excited and I was like, right, we're going to have a national launch, we're going to have an international launch. And when we... <laughs> <laughs> I was so surprised with, I always think it's going to be this small thing, maybe in the gallery, and Mikhail's already, you know, booked, like, the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra chorus, <laughs> and I was like, oh, gets me, I have to just take a second to go, no, that's okay, we can do that, yep, um, which is great, so she's so ambitious. <laughs> I sometimes just feel like I'm going on for the ride. But My yeah. ideas start out very large, and then they have to get yeah, no, that's good. chopped that's down good. by reality. Um, but we, I was chatting to the programmer about how we would have some kind of, I was like, oh, we need sort of an event to launch the app, and the app, Warren, who's an absolutely incredible programmer, as a very flippant sort of offhand remark suggested that, oh, the only way to avoid technical problems is to have somebody standing on a step singing. And again, I was just like, <laughs> we'll have a whole choir. Where do we get a choir from? <laughs> she wrangled a choir and then, um, yeah, I was only too happy to work with the whole choir. Um, we've got these apps going. My sort of, I guess, area of music composition I'm interested in is microtonal scales. So I did my PhD in that area where you basically have a lot more notes on the, on, available than you have on the piano. You have 12 notes on the piano, so I use scales that might have like 48 notes or 30 notes per octave. Um, so the idea of a choir having um, a phone and they're fed a note, um, even community choirs can pitch any note when you sort of hear it as a tone from a phone and so they're singing. So I thought, oh wow, I can do these like microtonal choral pieces. Um, and yeah, basically they were fed like the star data live through the phones and suddenly you could pull, we had you know, these sort of microtonal choral performances which were live star sonifications and Ricardo booked the first gig at Dark Mofo somehow. I'm not even sure how that happened. I turned up um, and made it happen and <laughs> you know, chose the scale and all that sort of thing. But um, yeah, we did a beautiful gig at dark mofo and it had lighting, live lighting that was the colours of the stars again, it's all linked to the live data sonification. Yeah. And the rest is history. <laughs> and I, I still call up Amanda and say, hey Amanda, and actually I sent her an email a couple of days ago feeding some information and occasionally Amanda says no mm -hmm. and sometimes I'm like, no, no, you have to say yes and so we have to try and <laughs> <laughs> wrangle it round. So one time I asked Amanda for contemporary art noise and she said oh, flat no. Oh my God. <laughs> then and I then a couple of months later. No, I found you could like with noise, you can filter noise into microtonal scales and certain, you know, resonate certain frequencies within noise. And then I was off and away. It was fine. You could have noise, but it was microtonal noise. So that was all good. And that was another big uh, 16 speaker uh, data sonification of the Earth's magnetic field. It was another dark mofo. Salonika Place, I think, in the art space. But yeah, she got me over the line. She did a day or two, just, yeah, had to get in the zone, but yeah. Um, just the mic is, yeah. we can't hear you. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, mic. I could hear you, but yeah, just the mic. And my mic's not, is it working now? You're on. Oh, sorry. Um, and I was going to ask too, because obviously Cosmic Time in particular was commissioned by Tarawara for the, would have been two, 20 now, I can't remember. So it's a few. It ended up being 2021. Yeah, but that's. There were a few delays. And you've performed it a number of times. This was the second performance. So, the, yeah, just at Tarawara and then mm -hmm. here last week. And we've also been fortunate enough to um, have a, a studio recording made. So that was launched as an album on Thursday, too. 
And so how has that work then evolved from Tarawara to here at Sydney Contemporary and then obviously kind of moving across different platforms such as the recording? Has it shifted and changed? Yeah, it's been a, a, quite a different sort of um, evolution, that project. So I was in, invited to um, come up with a durational performance that addressed cosmic time, mm -hmm. so tick. Um, <laughs> Um, and with that work, I sort of had a, quite a strong vision for what I, or over time, I um, had a residency at um, Powerhouse Museum to help assist developing in the work. So I spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to approach the subject matter and, and structure a musical response. Um, so I, and one of the interesting things about Amanda and I, our collaboration, Amanda is very visual <laughs> and enjoys colour and all these things, uh, whereas I send her text and an Excel document. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I sent Amanda a, a large Excel document <laughs> of my ideas for this work, and then Amanda turns it into music. <laughs> Michaela also has a background in music, and I think that helps. So both of us sort of getting towards the end of you know, high school, both were doing you know, music and art as our main subjects and had to make that call, you know, right when you finish school. Like, so I went into music and I come from a visual arts family and um, Michaela, you know, was very good at the flute and could have done that um, at uni as well. So I think Michaela has this understanding of music. I don't have to explain too much about the musical concepts. It just mm. sort of, that, that's a real advantage. Yeah. Yep. And I think too, like, obviously looking at your list of collaborators, that project in particular is a highly collaborative project. And, you know, both you and Janet, you know, you've been, you've both collaborated with scientists, yourself with the CSIRO and the Astronomy Residency and the Australian Antarctic um, Fellowship, which you were awarded in 2021 too. I guess I'm curious to ask yourself, Pinnery and Michaela, I'll open up to all three of you, like, why is collaboration important to your practice? And we'll get to co-authorship after. <laughs> Um, well, I, could, I can start. I guess it, it um, personally, it just explodes the horizons of what you're able to achieve um, and the vision that you can have for, for a work. So it, anybody I collaborate with, I don't even understand the boundaries of what the idea might be. So all of a sudden, rather than just working in this little circle that involves you, all of a sudden, the possibilities just explode infinitely. Um, and you can share you know, on a practical sense, you can share the workload, you can share the, the capacity and, um, yeah. And it's also exciting putting an out idea out there and not having necessarily control over what comes back because sometimes the, often, usually, the results are much more magnificent you could, than you could have imagined. So, for example, the costumes for both of the um, performative works Amanda and I have done, so Galaxy of Suns as well as Cosmic Time, were created by um, Katie B. Plummer, who's a Sydney-based um, artist, makes phenomenal work in her own right and has... Yeah, she's just made us the most incredible costumes. And I had a meeting with Katie during the development of Cosmic Time. I had an idea of what she might do. She does a lot of hand-dyed fabric works in her own practice. So I was like, perfect, that's, that's going to work out. And she came back at me with the idea of feathers. And I was like, feathers? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then half an hour later, I'm like, yeah, feathers. It's all about the feathers. So we have these incredible costumes. It's amazing. Yeah. There's that moment in, Michaela, um, Michaela's just published a book with Formist, and I was reading your interview with Annika Christensen, where you say, um, it's like a rare find when you can actually speak to other people about your ideas and kind of share the excitement around those ideas. And I really resonated with that, you know, particularly you, you talked about too, like going to the astronomy residency and sitting, you know, thinking you knew a lot about astronomy, but actually sitting side by side with scientists and everyone's kind of got their niche. So that kind of, again, that sharing and learning from one another was so critical. Was Absolutely, so critical and collaborations part. don't always work. <laughs> I guess that's important too. Like it's pretty rare to find somebody that you can you feel an affinity with and you share Absolutely. a creative vision. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes the collaborations I find with scientists are the, the knowledge that they offer you that expands your mind and your vision for possibilities. And often, like more recently in Antarctica, where um, they've, um, a lot of the scientists have given me a lot of their visual material as well. So that's another type of opening up for you. And I think it's really fantastic that this thing you can share and um, 
and even, it, it, like in some cases that sharing the load or or not working is I find often if it's like artists trying to collaborate mm. rather than people in their own fields yeah that because that adds up to something rather than gets contorted. <laughs> I think so too and I've worked on projects with artists who've collaborated with scientists and like one of my learnings from that is um, like for scientists outside of peer journals there is no, no. Kind of place for them to exhibit their, the knowledge that they produce yeah. um, outside of those journals. They don't have museums yeah. and art galleries yeah. and so working with visual artists yeah. becomes this critical moment where like that idea of science communication yeah. is quite real and Reaches tangible. Yeah, yeah, you have reach with yeah. kind of audiences to share ideas and research that is so important to our times. And you know, at Artspace, we work with many people, well, many artists who do collaborate with, mm. with scientists. And I find that, yeah, the, the kind of the space that I work in becomes a really important space for communication. And so I think I'd be inter yeah, interesting to see what comes of the Antarctic yeah. Fellowship yeah. for you if they're sharing the visual imagery that's produced there, yeah. But, but I do think collaborating with architects is very different. It's a very different field because yeah. it, it's, you, you don't have control of the work in the end, you yeah. know, totally. Yeah. Um, and Pinari, can I just ask you, you know, why is collaboration important to your practice? I think collaboration is about trust, mm. about letting go. And uh, I, I have, uh, you know, um, as a, as a visual artist, we have visions, but then sometimes I, I, I know it's uh, above my capacity, ca capacity and uh, I have to collaborate with architects and uh, to make sure the structure doesn't collapse. And, uh, and um, fortunate enough to, to like um, uh, have opportunities to collaborate with masters in glass, in paper, in print, and uh, um, and then you the the way you collaborate is like you're, you're friends before, but but then sometimes you you go into a residency and you meet these um, a team and and you meet them for the first time and and you uh, try to connect with them. Uh, I, I just met Chef Ralph uh, two days ago and uh, how. I think it's like uh, you learn to be open, mm -hmm. and and that's that's because uh, normally I'm I'm in the studio working by myself. I, I don't have any assistance in the studio, and and that's my private space. I paint, and uh, but then with these other projects, it's it's uh, a way to um, connect and communicate, and and I think that's that's important. I mean that's that's important for for me as an artist. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree. I think trust underpins yeah. all of this activity. You know, you have to allow for kind of the freedom and the flexibility of the project to kind of grow, et cetera, without trust, you know. And it's impossible to codify as well when you're kind of working in this way. So you're going to say... Yeah, no, I agree. Trust and also total respect for that person's work, you know, be it craftsmanship or knowledge or whatever. It's, to it's this thing of, you know, being uh, this... Um, yeah, a real, real respect for it, I think. It's really, yeah. And I don't want to leave that idea of co-authorship hanging because I think it's really important. And I think, you know, I think obviously working with practitioners across other fields, like the vocabulary can shift and change too. And I think, you know, in the space of visual arts, collaboration is meaningful and is genuine. And because it, it kind of, you know, that, that idea of sharing knowledge and resources is kind of everything that fuels um, our practices and our partnerships. But I think co-authorship is also another way of looking at it. And I think it's important because you, you're coming at it from a different perspective of way to kind of build an understanding of, of the way you're working together. And well, for, for me, we're not actually doing anything different to what we usually do. And so oftentimes, however, there is an opportunity which one is able to see that is about one plus one equaling three. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that Janet was doing anything other than what she usually does in our situation. So in that sense, collaboration for me is something that 
imports uh, a number of people into the same disciplinary exercise engaged in a pursuit where an answer is not known or predictable. If we're co-authoring, then we're sitting in a space where th there's predictability about what Janet's doing, for instance, in my work, and I am very predictable because we have to be. We have to be very um, disciplined in what is going to be the vision and everything has to be very measured in terms of the constructability of it, etc. Then it isn't the same as sitting and wondering what something could be and not knowing the answer. It's having a vision about something now in our domain that is understood by us, that is also understood to have this dimension of the possibility of being more than the sum of its parts, and then coalescing that and making that into something which is a composition in space for people's understanding of space in a different way. That's very different to collaborating and sitting in a room and working out something that we don't know the answer to. Um, so I don't want to call it collaboration for our purposes because I don't think it is. I think that's important to acknowledge, you know, different vocabularies. And if I can just ask you all, I'll open it up again. You know, you're all obviously having very different creative approaches from different fields. Like, were, were there any kind of challenges in working together? You know, in any way? I mean, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> Rob? I think the challenge, uh, ooh, I think it uh, would have been nicer, not necessarily a challenge, but it would have been nicer to be able to connect a few more times beforehand and <laughs> really to pick your brain and, and for you to pick mine. Um, unfortunately, the distance, I would say. Yeah, I think, again, time, trust, these are all um, kind of, you know, really important behaviours that are often in, kind of intangible and but it really critical to the process, to the creative process as well. So I think time. So, so we'll have a second event. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Maybe next time in Bangkok. <laughs> and Amanda? Oh, I can't think of anything. It all runs pretty smoothly. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's constant challenges, actually. <laughs> um, one of the challenges that I, I feel like, I guess I'm usually on the production sort of side of things, is navigating between art forms and fields. So our work and increasing, so Cosmic Time was essentially, it's a percussion quartet, you know, contemporary um, art music. So it's not even like, I mean, these words sort of cease, become, cease to become useful at some point, but it doesn't fit within the visual arts context terrifically well. So the idea of me asking for money for a stage um, manager, for example, like the visual arts just would be like, you don't need a stage manager. Um, <laughs> and yes. just having to quibble sort of through these, these and uh, actually budget as well, you know, the visual arts budgets are horrifically low, um, but you need to pay, we, we, we flew three professional musicians up from Melbourne, had to fly one down from Sydney for a rehearsal. Um, so I think there's lots of challenges within t like sort of um, just crossing these. I think platforms. even my composer friends that came too, they're struggling that there's a visual artist and it's a music thing. I'm trying to explain, well, Michaela provided the conceptual framework and the structure for the piece and then I fleshed it out with musical, you know, chords and ideas and then handed it to the percussionist, Louise, who then brought it to life with her choice of instrumentation and things like that. So, yeah, it's like almost a whole new way of working. So it is a music composition, but it, it's definitely the three parts coming together. So Makala's work often provides this real conceptual framework for my work, which is of, my, my work's pretty, like, I guess, abstract and um, I might even struggle to find a title for pieces of mine. <laughs> and then suddenly, it, you know, it has this whole other... Um, you know, meaning and, and reason for being. And yeah, so I think that's... And I think that's also a really important point that you both make, like one, remuneration, you know, like obviously that kind of, yeah, the, the difference between visual arts and the performing arts. And again, that notion of authorship and, and potentially copyright. And we've only got like five minutes, but I was going to ask <laughs> you, how do you, like, could you, like, how do you navigate that? It's tricky and actually crediting is a, is a constant battle so because the visual arts the artist is hero so there's this big name at the top and so the, it, there's so many layers to that um the way that everything's structured so the website even you know the templates for everything have got little spots and you don't have space for this 
you know, a huge, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I try my best, but but sometimes it's just going, hey, where's my name on that or something? Yeah, but, um, and, and but we goes the other way too with the music right. thing. We had once we did a piece and it was in a music concert, and then they said composer Amanda Cole, and then it didn't actually mention Michael. And I ha we had to go back and go. Actually, it's sort of it's, it's hard to explain in the music context how the piece that we both did. Um, it's almost like we maybe we're both the composer, or you know, there's that we have these roles, artist composer. So. Um, but in a band, that's completely normal to have multiple people, you know, working on a track together or something. But in being a composer, it's usually one person. So that really kind of confuses people or throws, throws people, yeah. And I've seen it happen with a number of artists working, particularly in performance. Um, we have many collaborators working across fields and, you know, it's kind of in a very early organic stages. It's great, like again, you're working with friends and peers and people you really respect, but then there's a moment when works potentially enter collections and this becomes really problematic because the question of who owns the work, you know, versus that sense of collectivity suddenly kind of comes to a pointy. And it can also change through the lifetime of a project as well. So you start a project with quite set roles or defined kind of parameters mm -hmm. and then everybody gets excited and everybody, yeah, it, it can shift. It's a moving feast, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> You're going along and seeing, yeah. really thinking about that. We're just making these works yeah. and dealing with all the other stuff that <laughs> comes along, I think. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, you know, kind of dealing with it all up front with a contract and as boring and as pragmatic and as dry as that is, I think it saves pain. It's like later. <laughs> sort of my whole, like, you don't have a contract. how I roll, but um, <laughs> I should be like you. <laughs> yeah, that's my job. But I wish, uh, I think we've run out of time, so I'd like to thank you, Angelo, Janet, Raphael, Pinnery, Amanda, and Michaela today for, you know, for your time and being so generous with kind of the ideas that underpin these major projects that you're all working with. If you can give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.